We wanted to make machine learning an open source project so that everyone outside of Google could use the same system we're using inside Google. everyone. I'm really pleased to be here to talk about one of the things that we're most excited about for the future, and that's artificial intelligence, or AI, and its transformative potential both at Google and beyond. Today we're in the middle of great change. This new era is characterized by advances in computing, particularly in artificial intelligence. And at Google, we've seen firsthand the possibilities that AI can create. In fact, today, there's very little technology at Google that isn't using machine learning, or ML, which is the primary approach underlying advancements in AI. ML is reinventing existing products, from maps to YouTube, and it's powering new experiences we never thought we'd be able to create. So what actually is machine learning and artificial intelligence? Let's start with a quick story. In the late 90s, when I was a student at Cambridge, I took a course called Neural Computing. And this course investigated the mechanisms by which biological nervous systems accomplish useful stuff like vision and response to stimuli. And these are functions we were interested in replicating with machine intelligence, but of course we would use completely different strategies, architectures, and hardware. So for a young computer scientist like myself, the goal was to learn how to build an artificial neural system that could emulate some of those biological principles in the hope of capturing some of the performance of humans on real world tasks. In other words, starting to create AI. And this is a field of research that has existed for a long time, many decades before my university days. And even then, we were building statistical models that were little more than cartoonish representations of how the brain worked. And in fact, it's only very recently that we've had real breakthroughs. And what changed wasn't the invention of new techniques, but the availability of much, much more compute power in the cloud and large data sets, which could be applied together with these much older ideas like neural networks. So how does it work? At its core, machine learning is a new way of creating problem-solving systems. For decades before, we used to write programs by hand to generate outputs given a certain set of inputs by applying very precise step-by-step -step instructions for the computer to follow. But rule-based systems don't always account for the messiness of the real world. So the breakthrough with machine learning is having computers improve their performance by showing them lots and lots of example data and correcting for errors rather than having to program them with rules. And that might mean something fun, like searching your phone for photos of cats and dogs. And we can do this by showing the system lots of examples, and it starts to learn from them. We call that process training. And then inference is when you apply that model you trained to new inputs it hasn't seen before in order to get a recognized output. So here's a fun example of something my team and I worked on, and maybe we can bring the camera on stage to take a look. So I'm wearing an Android Wear smartwatch. And when these watches first came out, entering text on the small screen was sometimes a bit difficult. And also, pictures convey much more meaning uh, than words. So what we did was we trained a neural network to recognize uh, emoji based on sketches on the screen. So let's take a look. You can see I've got a message here from my friend asking how we're getting on. I can press reply and tap into the emoji recognizer. Now, I'm going to sketch my favorite emoticon. Let's see how that goes. Uh, there's a lovely ice cream, which we can have uh, after the keynote. So you can see that the system is automatically recognizing what it was that I drew. Let's take a look at another fun example. A team at Google extended this technology to create a tool called Quick Draw, which uses a neural network to recognize doodles. Let's take a look at what I mean. So with this system, what you're going to see is the I see lightning, or zigzag, or arrow, something. or apple. 
and then as you draw, uh, it's going to try and guess what it is. So let's let's roll the video again. I see garden hose, or rainbow, or squiggle, or mountain. I see dumbbell, or stethoscope, or apple, or tooth. I see foot, or bear, or cat, or rhinoceros. I see frog, or raccoon. I see fox, or crab, or dog. I see spider. Sorry, I couldn't guess it. So not quick enough that time. Let's try again. I see snake, or spoon, or moon. Oh, I know, it's mustache. And one more. Well, maybe we'll leave it there. Um, and so it's, it's fun, and it's really useful. And I'm proud to say that the team created the world's largest Doodle data set, which they've shared publicly to help with future ML research in the future. And recently, the team took that research one step further with an even more useful tool called AutoDraw. So basically, it can take my unintelligible scribbles, and now that it's learned what they are, it can suggest the picture that I'm trying to draw. So let's create um, a little sketch of what's going on here in CAN that I can send back to my team. So I'll sketch out a palm tree. Um, and you see up at the top here, it's actually producing a tool that lets me choose the image I want. So we've got the palm tree. Let's have a nice bottle of rosé. Sketch that out. Um, we can choose exactly the picture we want. Um, and then maybe we'll add a glass to drink that wine out of. And that one with the wave looks nice. And then we put it all together to create a really useful diagram that I could send to my team to explain what we're doing here in CAN a little bit better. And it may look like fun and games, but we're pushing computers to do things they've never done before. If you think about it, understanding what something is and how to build it is a fundamental precursor for deep knowledge of the world and for creativity. So how do we take this one step further? How do we move beyond drawing and connect ML to art? For example, the Google Arts and Culture team used ML to map over 200,000 artworks based on their visual similarity. The output that you're going to see here is a single virtual map showing how all of this art connects together visually. You'll see clusters of impressionist landscapes, silhouettes, pottery, and so on. And let's zoom in to one cluster in particular. And what you're going to see here are portraits of people in robes. We can see here. It's going to show us a courtier from the Qing Dynasty in China, which is hundreds of years old. And then we can move on to a more recent portrait of a woman from Oaxaca in Mexico. And these paintings are from different centuries, different countries, and they're located in different museums. But through machine learning, the tool is able to recognize their inherent similarities, and it can form similar insights across the entire collection. So imagine how useful that could be to a student or a researcher in art. We're also using ML to develop new avenues of human expression. As humans, we inherently understand when things are musical. And for much of human history, we were limited to building instruments that create notes through physical properties, like air moving precise distances through a tube or vibrations across a string. And we then learned to assemble musical notes to create chords and scores. And composers go one step further by combining multiple instruments to create complex arrangements and symphonies. Well, a team at Google recently built a music generation tool called nSynth. And nSynth began as a massive database of sounds from 1,000 different instruments. The team then applied a neural net, which learned the audible characteristics of each instrument from first principles. And it can, in turn, mimic the sound of each instrument. The team took this work further to build a slider, which lets you explore the audible space between different instruments, creating entirely unique sounds. So let's take a look. Let's start with the flute. And then the guitar. And now let's combine them. So the samples aren't always perfectly in tune, and they do sound a little unusual, but we think that's what makes them fun. And since you could never create such an instrument like this, nSynth is a novel approach to music synthesis that can aid the creative process. 
So those are just a few examples of how we're using machine learning to explore the boundaries of artistic creation. And what's so exciting about this technology is how powerful it can be in solving a range of problems for people. And that's why we're also using advances in ML to make Google better, so it can be more assistive to our users. The best example of this is the Google Assistant. The Assistant lets you have a conversation with Google across devices and contexts. It can help you get things done in the real world by bringing together all of Google's services and ML-powered tools. For example, you can use your voice to ask things like, show me pictures of the okonomiyaki I had in Hiroshima. And yep, that is the actual okonomiyaki I had in Hiroshima. And it's pretty amazing, especially since I had no idea how to spell okonomiyaki. So the Google Assistant is available today on more than 100 million devices across Android phones, the iPhone, Google Home, and Android Wear. And it's coming soon to new devices like cars and TVs. But for the Assistant to better help users get things done, it needs to connect them with the services and the brands that they already like and use the same ones that all of you in this room are working on every day. So we created Actions on Google. It's a developer platform that enables everyone to build apps for the Assistant. Already many leading brands such as Spotify, Netflix, LG, and eBay have done this. And let's take a look at an example. Here's an upcoming app from Panera, which is a large US casual food chain. So I can just call up the Assistant. Hi, how can I help? I'd like delivery from Panera. Hi, this is Panera. I'll need your delivery address. Which one can I get from Google? So let's just tap on the one at the top. What can I get you started with? I'll have the strawberry poppy seed salad with steak instead of chicken. Got it. How about one of these cold drinks? OK, well, that agave lemonade looks pretty good, so we'll just tap on it. Great. Are you ready to check out? Yep. OK. The total is $18.40. Are you ready to place the order? Yes. And then I can just use my fingerprint to confirm the payment, and we're all set. Thanks. You're all set. So as you see, you can create today delightful and useful experiences. And as we expand the capabilities of the platform, you'll be able to apply your creativity to connect authentically through natural conversation with new and current users alike. Today, you can build apps for the Google Assistant in US English only. But before the end of the year, we will enable all of you, agencies, partners, developers, and marketers to create these apps in UK English, French, German, and many more languages. And we really look forward to working with all of you closely and connecting your services with Google Assistant users. You can visit developers.google.com actions to learn more or get in touch with any of the Google team here at Cannes. We're excited about how we can continue to use AI to reimagine our products and services at Google. But we know that technology is most powerful when everyone can use it. And the applications of AI and ML, classification, prediction, understanding, intersect very naturally with the challenges of enterprises worldwide. And that's why we're working to ensure that AI is widely available and that everyone can leverage its benefits, including businesses. So we do this principally in two ways. Through Google Cloud ML, which is a set of APIs that enable any enterprise to access easy to use machine learning in Google's cloud. And TensorFlow, our open source machine learning library that anyone, developers, researchers, businesses, can use for machine learning projects. Let's start with TensorFlow. A little more than a year ago, a former automobile designer in Japan named Makoto Koike started helping out at his parents' cucumber farm. And he was amazed by the amount of work it takes to sort cucumbers. In Japan, the best cucumbers are believed to be straight and thick with vivid colors and lots of little prickles. And bringing premium cucumbers to market really impacts a farmer's bottom line. So Makoto had heard about TensorFlow and wondered if it could help speed up this task at his parents' farm. And if you think about it, recognizing patterns is one of the things that ML is really good at. And he was right. Makoto used our software and a camera and a mechanical sorter and succeeded in training a computer to recognize the best cucumbers. And the more cucumbers that passed through the sorter, 
the better the computer got at selecting the very best ones for sale. And Makoto was happy because he could do the things he cares about most, like actually find tasks like sorting. And it applies to more serious examples as well. Take Airbus Defense and Space. They create aerospace products, and they're one of the world's largest suppliers of satellites. Now, satellite imagery is oftentimes obscured with imperfections like these clouds that you can see. And historically, removing them has been a very time-consuming and manual task. But it's also important. Everyone from precision farmers monitoring crop yields to environmental groups monitoring forestry need highly accurate satellite imagery to do their job. So to make this process easier, Airbus used APIs from Google Cloud ML to automate the detection and correction of their satellite imagery. This improved the accuracy and the speed with which they analyzed images. And in doing so, it solved a problem that the business had struggled with for decades. And we've even applied machine learning to our own business operations by using ML to make our data centers more efficient. Data centers, of course, are the physical infrastructure that underlie the virtual world. And these buildings of thousands of servers use a lot of energy. And without careful management, that energy demand would grow as rapidly as the internet does. So making them run efficiently is a really big deal for us. And using ML, we've seen a 40% reduction in the amount of energy used for cooling. It's still early days for these techniques, but we're also exploring ways to apply this same technology to improve power grids and other in energy intensive processes around the world. Our data centers also contain our own custom built silicon called cloud TPUs. And that's hardware that is designed to handle the computationally intense training and inference tasks I mentioned earlier. And we now make them available to our cloud customers like Airbus so they can take advantage of the same technology that we use to power our own products and services. And that makes using ML faster and much, much cheaper. And we make them available for free to the ML research community so we can all work together to accelerate ML breakthroughs for everyone. As technologists, we're always aspiring to create tools that help the greatest number of people. And we're optimistic that ML can be applied to all kinds of things from understanding language, to fighting climate change, to making enterprises more efficient. And one area where applied ML may be able to help is improving conversations online. Discussing things that you care about can be difficult. And the threat of abuse and harassment online means that many people stop expressing themselves altogether and even give up on seeking different opinions. To tell you more, here's Jared. Good morning, everybody. Uh, and thank you, David, for that extraordinary presentation. Uh, even being in the same kind of Google Alphabet family, I really never get tired about, of hearing all the innovative things that are happening with AI throughout the company. As David mentioned, my name is Jared Cohen. I'm the CEO of Jigsaw at Alphabet, where I also serve as chief advisor to Alphabet's executive chairman. What David talked to you about this morning was some of the amazing innovations happening with AI at Google. What I'm gonna to do today is talk to you about something specific, which is how we're using artificial intelligence to tackle what is arguably the most universally understood challenge for anybody on the internet, which is just the decline in civility of conversation um, and toxicity beginning to happen at scale. But before I do that, let me give you a little bit of a background on Jigsaw and what we're all about. Jigsaw is an engineering group within Alphabet that at its core is about making people around the world safer. So what that means is we're literally throwing the best engineering that we have at some of the toughest global security and geopolitical challenges in the entire world. From thwarting censorship and combating the most robust and nefarious cyber attacks to countering online radicalization and disrupting state-sponsored disinformation efforts. And of course, more recently, looking for ways to use our engineering capacity to curb online harassment. Now, if you think about the gravity of these challenges, 
you think about the seriousness of these challenges, they're a little bit more controversial and thorny, and I would argue different than the types of challenges that you typically think of a Silicon Valley company working on. Um, so not surprisingly, at Jigsaw, we have a unique methodology that we use for going about addressing some of these. So our team of engineers, product managers, research scientists, they get out into the world, they travel to some of the most restive and complicated environments around the globe. So what that means is we've sent engineers to the Syrian border and to the Iranian border to talk to activists and, and dissidents about the state of the censorship machine in their respective countries. We've also met with activists and dissidents around the world to understand what they're up against, from the Syrian Electronic Army to the Iranian Cyber Army. I have a group of people who literally, on their first week on the job, we sent them to Iraq to interview uh, ISIS defectors. Uh, in some of these cases, these individuals fled the Islamic State just three or four weeks before our team interviewed them. And they interviewed them to try to understand you know, what role technology may or may not have played in their radicalization process, and more importantly, what role technology could play in potentially having diverted them off the radicalization path. You know, we've sent product managers down to do ride-alongs with police in some of the most violent favelas in Brazil, with the goal of seeing how technology can help bridge a divide uh, where erosion of trust has happened between law enforcement and citizens. You know, we've sent individuals to investigate some of the most prominent state-sponsored troll farms in the entire world. Uh, we've sent, uh, most recently, a group of people from Jigsaw to Macedonia to track down fake news editors uh, who launder in disinformation to try to understand uh, their rationale, their motivations, their incentives, and the methodologies that they use so that we could begin to look for ways to reverse engineer that and hopefully combat it. We've done the same, sending people to interview pirates in Somalia, 419 scammers in Nigeria, et cetera, et cetera, all again with the aim of understanding how these challenges are evolving in these complicated environments so that we can use technology to disrupt what are an increasingly complex set of issues in the world. Now, I mentioned to you that we kind of get out there into the wild, and you have to do that in order to really appreciate firsthand. You can't sit in a Google office, you can't uh, sit in front of a screen without building the sort of human intelligence necessary uh, to complement the engineering capacity. But back to the issue at hand, you know, which is this issue of toxicity on the internet. So let's look at toxicity by the numbers. So if we look at toxicity by the numbers, how many of you by show of hands have ever witnessed cyberbullying or online harassment in a discussion that you've been part of? Ra raise, raise them high so I can see. A lot of you. So for those of you who raised your hands, you're part of 72% of the global internet population that's had a similar experience. Now how many of you by show of hands have ever had somebody just lob nastiness at you? Uh, or, you know, harass you or bully you online? How many of you are direct, you know, sort of recipients or have been on the receiving end of that? Again, ra raise them high so I can see. Okay, so for those of you that did that, you're, you know, roughly part of an almost 50% of the global internet population that's had that experience. But here's a number that's also not up there. Roughly a third of people online say that they self-censor out of fear of what people might do in retaliation for something that they say. So obviously, if you look at these raw numbers, this is a huge problem, right? And it's not just a societal problem, it's a business problem as well. Right? So toxicity on platforms means that engagement you know, ends up floundering. It means that people flee the conversation. And there's this awkward irony that it's in the democratic societies where you want to allow the free flow of information but also protect people from harassment that many publishers and platforms, out of just an inability to figure out how to manage all this, end up shutting down comments and discussion altogether or partially shutting down comments and discussion. But there's also a normative issue here. How many of you, by show of hands, have small children? So, like you, I have a three-year-old and a one-year-old, two girls. And you look at this sort of spread of toxicity, and you can't help but to wonder if this is the frame of reference that they're going to have for how people talk to each other, and they're going to be the first generation to split their time between physical and digital worlds, basically from the time that they're born. Is this just what they're going to come to expect? Um, you know, are they just going to sort of assume that this is how people talk to each other? And it doesn't have to be that way. Um, so, you know, enter 
um, you know, enter sort of the, the sort of the methodology that I mentioned at, at the beginning. So when we thought about, you know, this sort of problem of toxicity on the internet, what you're hearing me talk about right now is essentially the meanness problem and the nastiness problem. And I'm not trivializing that by any stretch of the imagination, but there's actually an even bigger challenge on the horizon that the team of engineers and research scientists and product managers at Jigsaw became particularly fixated on as they traveled to some of these complicated environments. And in particular, as we spent time in countries that are ridden with political, ethnic, and sectarian violence, there was a concern among the engineers on the team that the nastiness that is seen in the street as these societies come online will spill over onto the internet. And they desperately wanted to do something about that. And they developed a view that there's a window of opportunity as these societies come online to use the best technology that we have to ensure that that spillover doesn't happen. Now, like any project where you want to apply machine learning, um, it comes down to how much data do you have, what's the quality of that data, and what's your capacity to make use of that data. So what's interesting is in the process of wanting to address the ways in which political, ethnic, and sectarian conflicts manifest themselves online, the engineers stumbled onto a different problem, which is the one that you know, we all sort of refer to as the kind of meanness problem or the bullying problem. They just viewed it a little differently, right? As they talked to citizens in some of these countries, what they were worried about is what happens when cyberbullying becomes better organized, better funded, and state-sponsored. But again, if you look at where the data is, it's largely right now with mainstream publishers and platforms, which is a fantastic place to start. So enter Perspective, which is a technology that we built that uses machine learning to spot harassment and toxicity um, on the web. And what we did was we trained a machine learning model uh, by showing it tens of millions of examples of abusive or toxic language. Uh, thanks to strategic partnerships with the New York Times, with Wikipedia, and a number of others. And in this case, by the way, we're defining toxicity as like a comment that is likely to cause somebody to leave the conversation. So in building this initial model, we then sort of went through a stage where we were doing some experimentation and some iteration, getting more data, um, doing more research to accompany the engineering development that focused on making sure we were accounting for things like machine learning bias and so forth. And the result of this, the result of this is um, sort of an early version of Perspective that we released in February uh, in the form of an API which, and let me sort of describe for you how it works. If you're a publisher or a platform, you can run all of your comments and discussions through this API, and you receive a score back, zero to 100, of how likely that comment is to be toxic. Um, now, it's a measurement tool, so what you do with that score as a publisher or platform is entirely up to you. Our goal was to put the power of machine learning in the hands of the platforms and publishers that are facilitating these conversations. And by the way, we did this as a reaction to a demand that we knew was out there. You know, most publishers and platforms have human moderators that just sort of lack um, the sort of, the, 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 you can't hire enough humans to manage all the discussions in the way that in the terms of service they, they sort of articulate a desire to. Um, so right now, you know, this is available. Um, as I mentioned, um, you know, there's lots of different ways that it can be used. It's ultimately for the publishers and platforms to decide. But let me sort of walk you through some obvious integrations. And before doing that, I'll observe that there's basically three types of characters on the internet, right? You have moderators, you have readers, and you have authors. And let me start with an example of readers. So um, you right here in the front row, what's your, what's your name? Yes. Leon, so where do you work? I'm a student in Munich. Okay, so Leon is a student in Munich. Um, and let's do a little role play here. Let's assume Leon is the sort of nicer and sort of more sensible of the two of us. And let's assume that I'm just one of these people that I want to see it all. There's no reason why Leon and I shouldn't be able to read the same article um, with the same comments thread, but dynamically turn the volume of toxicity up or down depending on our threshold. And even though Leon is very nice, let's say after lunch, he sort of like, you know, has a higher threshold. So after he's eaten and he feels better, he can turn the volume up and he'll see more comments. 
You know, so here with this demo, you see a discussion of climate change where, um, you know, you, as, you, as the slider moves in one direction or the other, you'll see the comments that are visible changing dynamically. And in this case, the machine is filtering not by topic, it's filtering by tone. Um, now, another example that I'll show you has to do with the authorship experience. So here you'll see, you know, uh, sort of the prompting. You can imagine a situation on a platform where somebody types in a comment and you receive a score back of how likely that comment is to be toxic. Now, what's interesting is we incorrectly assume oftentimes that the majority of toxicity on the internet is the work of organized trolling efforts. And trolls, you know, certainly play a role individually and as a sort of collective enterprise, but the research has also shown that a lot of toxic comments are people that either just lack self-awareness um, or having a bad day or something else. And the research also shows that this tiny little bit of feedback can actually have a huge impact in making somebody uh, alter what they're, what they're writing. Um, so again, these are just sort of a handful of examples uh, with viewership and authorship, but you could also imagine the following situation. How many of you by show of hands have ever just been in a really bad mood, you know, been really mad about something, you just sort of fire off an email that's, you know, sort of unnecessarily obnoxious, and maybe you didn't sort of click undo within 15 seconds? Be, be honest, I mean, I'm sure every one of you, right? You know, we're all, we're all human. So what if you could just set, you know, what if you could set a toxicity threshold on the emails that you send and say, I never want to send an email with a toxicity score north of 75. You literally could write your emails and not have to worry about what kind of mood you're in. Um, but you could also imagine publishers and platforms, you know, having a threshold for toxicity that they set across their platform um, and using the equivalent of spell check for toxicity to help the people writing the comments um, do, make their sort of obnoxious point uh, within the sort of boundaries that that particular publisher or platform has set forth. Now, as you hear this, you might think to yourself, well, isn't that sort of shutting down speech? Isn't that making it harder for people to convey their point? You know, two points on this. Quite the opposite. Right now, the default position is publishers and platforms, because they can't manage all this, are increasingly shutting down comments or partially shutting down comments. Two, the sensible people are all fleeing the conversation, so what you get is sort of troll talking to troll or toxic person talking to toxic person. And in this case, you're actually using machine learning to make it easier for people to convey their point um, in ways that calibrate for varying degrees of comfort with toxicity uh, from viewer to author to moderator. So I've shown you a sort of reader experience. I've shown you an author experience. Now let me show you a moderator experience. Uh, and let's use the New York Times as a case study. Um, so the New York Times, which rightfully so is considered among the best at human moderation, both in terms of capacity um, and in terms of quality control, right now hires 10 full-time employees who are able to look at 10,000 comments a day and moderate them. And that may sound like a lot, except those 10,000 comments only account for 10% of the total 200 articles that are published on the New York Times every single day. So despite the aspiration to want to allow comments and discussion across every single article in the New York Times, the limits of human moderation only allow them to get to 10%. Um, so we built a partnership with the New York Times to help them integrate perspective. Um, you know, and as a result, uh, as of I think a week and a half ago, they're now able to expand comments and turn them on for all their top stories and all their opinion pieces. Um, and what was sort of remarkable about this is, and somebody can correct me if I'm wrong, but, but we believe that this may be the very first instance of a major publisher reversing a trend that has sort of been forcing publishers and platforms to restrict comments and reverse that trend towards expanding comments uh, at scale. So just to sort of visualize this a little bit, let's look at a, a little before and after. So here what you see is about a week and a half ago, and try to ignore the sort of Trump, Comey, Theresa May stuff, because it's distracting. Um, and what you'll see is, you know, this is the before. You know, you have comments on only three of the top stories. And this is the after. You have comments now on 11 of the top stories, which is almost a 4x increase. It's the same thing for opinion pieces. So this is the before. Um, you have comments uh, allowed on five of the opinion pieces. And this is the after. Um, you now have it on 11, which again, more than a, a, a 2x increase. 
Um, so the question is sort of how do we do this? So I mentioned, you know, you have moderators, you have readers, you have authors, and there's no one application uh, that needs to be the sort of gold standard for how uh, perspective is used in any of those capacities. In the case of the New York Times, we co-developed a tool with them uh, that, as you can see here, allows them to represent all the comments on every article on a sliding scale so they can set toxicity thresholds for what will require, what will be flagged for human review, what will be batch accepted, what will be batch rejected. And again, this is just sort of one, this is just one example. Now, what's interesting is this is just one model, right? So what I've talked about is your perspective, you know, down the road is going to be a collection of models that are designed to empower publishers and platforms to facilitate better conversation. So what you've seen today is the toxicity model. But we're also experimenting with a number of other models. Uh, we're experimenting with a model around insubstantiality, uh, obscenity, personal attack, attack on commenter, off topic. So why are we doing all of this? Well, just because a comment section or a discussion is civil, it doesn't mean that all of you will necessarily participate in a conversation. You know, ideally, a conversation is most efficient when it's civil and it's coherent. Um, and again, it's not up to us, you know, as sort of Google Alphabet to determine, you know, how sort of which models are, are used to facilitate better conversations and how the scores and measurement tools are, are used for moderation, uh, readership, or authorship. We just want to make it all available. So as we sort of progress on this, you can imagine if you're a publisher or a platform looking at the sort of range of models that you have at your disposal and deciding that, you know, you want your moderators to be able to, you know, measure language for insubstantiality, for toxicity, um, and for off topic. And again, you'll receive scores back zero to 100 uh, for each of those. And the sort of number of models that we can build over the course of time, you know, is kind of, is kind of endless. So it's a pretty exciting chapter. Again, we just launched this in the early early stages in, Feb in February. Um, and what's nice is the more, um, uh, the more we experiment with it in the wild, um, you know, the more opportunities there are for iteration on the model. So I encourage all of you, go to perspectiveapi.com and play around with typing things into um, the toxicity box. I'm not sure if that's what we call it. Um, and see if you can get yourself a 100% score. Uh, I'm not sure anybody ever has. Uh, many people ha have tried, but play around with it, and you'll find some false positives, and I think that's, you know, that, that, that's by design, uh, because we want those false positives flagged and we want them corrected. Um, now, you know, as we sort of sum up here, you heard David talk about, you know, some of the amazing things happening with AI at Google. You've heard me talk about how uh, machine learning can be used to tackle some of these sort of seemingly intractable problems, right? And there is a lot of, you know, sort of hysteria oftentimes around AI, and nobody would claim that, you know, artificial intelligence or machine learning is a panacea to all the world's problems, right? So, you know, debate is healthy. But if you look at what I just showed you in terms of discussion online, here's a seemingly intractable problem, right? I mean, it really is seemingly intractable that you can reverse the trend of conversation becoming more toxic and more people fleeing the conversation and more discussion platforms shutting down. Um, but the advent of machine learning means that for the first time, we're able to have um, the technology catch up with our values. Um, which is a pretty exciting moment. You know, it's also exciting to do things that for once make things more difficult for trolls, right? Level the playing field so that they have, they, you know, their sort of asymmetric tactics no longer have a disproportionate advantage. But the other aspect of this is if we look at how the world is changing, um, and I want to sort of leave you with this point about machine learning, um, if we look at the last decade and a half, it's largely been a story about um, you know, the advent of technology, you know, that is to say an access revolution. But if you just look at the numbers, they say by 2020, you know, there'll be more smartphones in circulation than there are people in the entire world. And that's before you even get into the Internet of Things and, and, and everything else. So what that means is you literally have massive amounts of data being generated by citizens in 196 countries on Earth. Um, and all of a sudden, the challenges of the world um, you know, that were seemingly intractable or the challenges in the world that, you know, prior to this moment had no potential technological solution, all of a sudden we can at a minimum begin to ask the question, can we use machine learning to make a dent in these challenges? And 
Sometimes we can, sometimes we can't, right? You can't, it's not, it's not obvious how you would use machine learning if you were sort of, you know, a starving individual, or if you were, you know, uh, if you needed, you know, water, or if you needed to inject yourself with medicine that you didn't have available. So it can't solve every problem, but what we do know is that if you look at the history of our society and our world, it's never been a smart move to decide that we're not going to use the best technology that we have at our disposal to troubleshoot some of the world's greatest challenges. Um, and so it's a particularly exciting time to be working in machine learning. It's a particularly exciting time to work in technology. And as I look out at all of you, it's a particularly exciting time to do the work that all of you are doing um, because so much of what is out there so much of you know, the visibility that we have into the world's challenges today, again, for the first time, have an opportunity for us to come up with innovative solutions that may never have been possible in the past. So thank you for your time, and it was a pleasure to be here with you this morning. Thanks very much to Jared Cohen. Thank you, Jared. Jared Cohen from Jigsaw, and uh, to David Singleton and his team at Google. A fantastic first session for this day three of the Can Lions 2017.